We're going through a sermon series called Dealing with the Death Parade. Boy, that's a fun title. It's interesting to see how uneasy people get about a sermon title or a series title. If you Google Death Parade, you find out that it's a Japanese anime film. It's probably not the most tactful content in the world. I haven't checked it out, but I promise you this, this series has nothing to do with that. And the reason is, is I don't need a cartoon to tell me how bad things are. All I've got to do is look out the window or my newspaper. What we're dealing with is the tragedy that we see befalling people right now and trying to answer the question, what in the world is going on, why is it going on, and what is the solution to the situation? There was a court decision just made in the U.K., that a disabled woman who is pregnant 22 weeks has been mandated, regardless of her personal pleas and the pleas of her mother, to take care of the child, that she has to have an abortion. Otherwise, she's breaking the law. Court ordered. You think she's going to win that? That's where we are. That's where we are. We're now opening clinics for pediatric gender transference. We now have schools that if a child so desires to transition from one sex to another, well, that's fine. And we'll call them by whatever pronoun they want to be called by, but we're not going to tell the parents. Let me tell you something very plainly so that it's not misunderstood. Satan wants your children. Period. And he's not even as disguised anymore as he used to be. Because sadly, the state that we're at, he doesn't have to be. Sin is acceptable. And those things that is considered righteous, good, holy, have become strange, foreign, and detestable. You don't need to look much further than the heart to find where the problem lies. Now my hope today is to offer you a hopeful sermon. We haven't started very well, have we? That's okay. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Romans 1. We've been spending this time walking through the passage of Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 32 to answer these questions. And the reason is, is because Paul answers this question in this passage. Now, I'm, I'm usually a really, really bad person at not letting the cat out of the bag. You know, guess what? And before he makes anything, I'll just tell him, right? That kind of thing. Uh, it, it just doesn't work with me sometimes, but I'm trying really hard to reserve, and hopefully if you've become more and more repetitiously familiar with this passage, the Holy Spirit is starting to help you see what exactly is going on and why the world is in the shape that it's in. We would all agree that it's tragic, but we also want to ask that classic question, why? Why? And by the time we're done with the sermon series, not today, but the series, we will answer that. So let's read verses 16 through 20. And since 16 is the memory verse for this month, let's read 16 together. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Today we are going to look at three ways that God has revealed himself. We hear so many people today want to claim that there is 
no God. In fact, even the Bible tells us the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And yet God has gone to great lengths in order to reveal himself so that any question about his existence or his working has been completely erased or should be erased from the argument. Yet this is an argument we're having all day long. Now I don't have to get into the creation evolution debate, but simply the fact that the debate exists shows you the rebellion against what God has said he has made clearly both within them and what has been made. Now the first thing that we're not going to spend hardly any time on because the rest of the passage deals with this is the wrath of God. The wrath of God is a display of his hot displeasure against sinful actions of people. And remember, the problem is, is that we all serve at some time, at some point in our lives, as suppressionists. There is something that is true that is made plain, and our evil desire is to cover it up, either because we enjoy the sin, because it's a work of darkness, because we don't want to have anything to do with the truth, because we don't want to be convicted, because we're scared to death that for some reason Jesus is going to change our lives and it's going to be worse in some way. That's a scary place to be when the one who is eternal and full of love and calling us to eternal life would be deemed as someone who is going to damage my life if I dare trust him. This is a twisted logic. This is a twisted approach. So when we talk about the wrath of God, we are talking about what is manifested because he is a God that is just, but he is also a God that demonstrates anger towards sin. It's not just to do with with being an attribute. It is also a revelation of himself. Now, let me give you an example. When I came off the stage earlier to pray, and Cheryl began to play, I went over, and I looked, and my son had flopped like a fish on the floor. And I thought, okay, he's dead, or he's defiant. And I could tell from the look on my wife's face what the answer was. So I scooped him up, and I encouraged him about my hot displeasure towards his not listening and not obeying. The simple fact that we take those types of actions when we see things that are wrong is a display that we understand right and wrong. And the fact that we are acting in relation to our father, not spanking him out of anger, but spanking him out of the simple fact of what you are doing is wrong. There is a standard, it is definitive, and your retaliation is is unacceptable. That is no different than what this book tells us from the very beginning. So when we talk about wrath, we talk about that it is a revealing of God's despising sin. He hates sin. We clear on that one? So that's the first one. Again, we're going to deal with that as it unfolds later, so there will be more and more to be said. But here's our second one. Righteousness. Does everybody see where it says, verse 17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is what? Revealed. God wants to demonstrate something. And in fact, you see that that relationship is from faith to faith. Not just justification, go to heaven when I die. But as I seek to live righteously, in obedience, in the power of the Spirit, I am manifesting, I am revealing the righteousness of God through me. Why? Because I'm a holy person? No, because Christ is now my life. It is no longer my life that I'm living. It is the desire to get out of the way and let Christ live his life through me. And when he lives his life through me, it demonstrates his righteousness. It is revealed to people. Now, let me show you some examples of how we know that this is true. Turn over one page to chapter 2. It might be one page for you. And look at verses 14 and 15 and 16. <clears throat> This is not a hard concept to grab because this passage lets us know that it's even possible for pagans to demonstrate that. Now, when I use the word pagan, don't get offended. 
I don't mean it in a demeaning or pejorative term. I'm simply talking about someone who probably has no relationship or no respect for God, the creator of all things. So don't think that I'm slandering somebody or anything. I'm just talking about godless people, okay? So now watch this, verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, God's written standard of righteousness. How do we know what righteousness and perfection is? God wrote it out in the law. So notice this. When Gentiles who don't have this law, look what it says they do, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law or a law to themselves. Everybody see this word instinctively? It's the idea that they just do it naturally. It's the idea that there's something ingrained in them that when they're operating in everyday life, they just do it. Even Bill Gates can give millions of dollars to blind children. You see what I'm saying? None of us could sit here and say, that's a terrible thing. Why in the world is Bill Gates wasting his money like that on these kids? We would say, no, that's a great thing. That's a wonderful thing. Is it a God-glorifying thing? No. But is it a good thing to do? Yeah, it is. Even lost people have standards of right and wrong. Notice what it says after that. Verse 15, For when Gentiles do not have the law, do instinctively, naturally, the things of the law. These not having a law, they they don't have that standard. They're a law themselves. And notice this, in that they show the work of the law written on their where? Man, isn't that interesting? It's not only written on their hearts, but look what happens after that. Look at the connection. Their conscience bearing witness. And their thoughts, alternately, excuse me, how do you say this word? I want to say alternatively. There's no V in here. Anytime I can't pronounce a word, I'm just going to point at Chuck. Praise the Lord. (coughs) Alternately, forgive me, accusing or else defending them on the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. What in the world is that saying? It's saying because God has taken the time to have every one of his special creations, being you and I, come into being. He makes sure that the law of his standards are written on our hearts so that even consciously when we're going about, we would still do these things naturally if we were in certain situations, defending people who need help, our hearts going out to people that need it. Anybody turn the channel when the sad, abused puppy commercial comes on? Why? We don't want to see that. It's wrong. Those puppies deserve better right? No. (laughs) I I would never harm a cat. I hate cats. They're so stuck up. Anyway, they are. Anyway, but notice it's written on their hearts. And notice it says that their conscience bearing witness. You know what that means? Their very conscience will testify against them on the day of judgment. So you can get away from the law. Oh, nobody will never know that I did that. You can hide all the secrets that you want in the world and bury them as far as the sea is. But you can never escape the conscience. And can you imagine for the person who doesn't know Jesus Christ, when they stand to give account of their life, when eternity is over, One of the first people on the witness stand is going to be their conscience testifying against them because they knew internally what was right and what was wrong. So this isn't a difficult concept for us to grasp, the idea that righteousness is there in some way. Everybody agree? Okay, good. Let's go to one that we're all familiar with. John 13. Turn over to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. and We're going to look at 34 and 35. If you remember, this was a memory verse of ours a few months ago. Hopefully we still have that memorized. Important verse. Great ramifications come out of it. <clears throat> John 13, 34, and 35. Look what it says here. A new commandment I give to you. Now Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he says here that you love one another. Even as, here's the standard, here's the prototype. I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, by us loving one another as Jesus has loved us. So the first thing you have to do to grasp this is get out a piece of paper and a pencil and start taking an inventory of what the scriptures tell you about how much Jesus loves you. 
There's where it gets our mind straight, and what it does is it cultivates humility in the prideful hard heart. It brings us low in his presence. And notice what it says after that. By this, all men will, what's the word? They'll know. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If, and in this case, I don't like that word. And here's the reason why, because it calls me to make the difference. If, if you have love for one another. If I will take the time to love you as Jesus loves me, and hold on to your hats, people. And if you will take the time to love me as Jesus loves you. I know, Tom. (laughs) People will know. Righteousness will be demonstrated in the body of Christ. There's so many people that give reasons as to why they don't want to go to church or have anything to do with church. Why don't we be different and love one another as Jesus has loved us and give everybody a reason why they shouldn't go to church or shouldn't be at church? That's right. I don't know. Does everybody get that, though? By simply demonstrating love for one another, there's no reason for coldness in the body of Christ. There's no reason for sin To keep on going in the body of Christ, there's no reason for strife, any of these things. It's not unusual because even Paul had to warn his congregations that he planted against these things. But for us to be sensitive to the Spirit and recognize this is hindering the revelation of God through the body of Christ to grab the attention of the people around us for us to serve as a beacon in this city. It's worth it. It's worth it to confess those things and be humble before the Lord and demonstrate this love. There's one example. Now do this. Turn over four chapters to 17. This is Jesus' prayer in the garden before he was betrayed. <clears throat> and we're going to start, <laughs> excuse me, in verse 17. Gives us a running context into this so we see what's going on. He says here, Jesus is praying to the Father, sanctify them, set them apart. In the truth, only the truth is what sanctifies. And notice what he says, your word is truth. Let me stop for a second and bring up a point about this, because the subject here is unity. There should be nothing that divides the body of Christ. In fact, if you read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, you find out that denominations are demonic, period. But here's the reason why we have them. Let me be clear about that. Because we can't agree on two things. Number one, we can't agree that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. That it is exactly what God has said to us to give us everything, not for just life, faith, practice, but defines the parameters of existence, and when it speaks, it speaks authoritatively. How do we know this? Because the church in America is waffling on whether or not homosexuality is a sin or not. Guess what? This clears up that argument. You know the problem? We don't like that answer. And so we rail against it. Well, it was just written by a bunch of men. You know what that tells me? You don't know your Bible. You don't have the first clue about what the Word of God really is. It's not just a guidebook. Sometimes we pull this out like it's a treasure map. We're expecting there to be an X somewhere in the pages. It's not what this is. It is God's word to us. Unfolding and manifesting his love towards us and warning us of the wrath to come because of rebellious sin that denies his word. I don't know if you realize this, but you and I aren't any different than the prophets of the Old Testament today. Except instead of receiving a revelation from God, we already have it. And have had it for a long time. So why can't churches get together? Why can't everybody get along? Well, number one, because they don't believe that the Bible is God's word. That's the first problem. Number two, they want to add everything under the sun to salvation. Salvation is by God's grace alone, completely undeserved. We don't deserve it ever. Through personal faith alone, a conviction, a confident conviction that you believe that it's true that Jesus has died on the cross for your sins and risen from the grave. And that only by faith in his name, you're saved. Nothing else. Faith alone. Alone means by itself. Sola. By itself. Done. 
You don't need to be baptized. You don't need to join a church. You don't need to walk an aisle. You don't need to pray a prayer. You don't need to change your hair color. You don't need to change your clothes that you wear. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to divorce the person that you're with. No other requirement has been set forward whatsoever for acceptance before God because all the work that was necessary for acceptance has already been done for us through the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He lives so that we can live. The only thing I bring to the table is the very sin I need to be saved from. So this idea that my works merit anything before his face, that idea has got to get out of the window. I know that everybody loves that idea because it makes us feel good. That's how we check whether or not we're really saved. Let me save you some trouble. He who believes in me has eternal life. Let's base it off of the promise of God Almighty, not where the wind blows. So there's our two reasons why we can't get along. Now let's go through this and see what Jesus has to say about it because this demonstrates Jesus' heart towards those ends. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world, talking about the disciples. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these only. Not on behalf of the eleven only. Notice where he goes here. But for those who believe in me through their word. Who's that? Us. Did you realize you're in the Bible? This is you. We have believed because of the message handed down by the apostles. So in that case, whatever's coming up is extremely important for us to gravitate towards. Verse 21, that they may all be one. In what way? Even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. What's the reason? Here it is. So that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, unity in the body is significant in regards to evangelism. When they see the church not only loving one another as Christ has loved us, but also getting along and being unified, having all things in common as the first church was in Acts 2, all of a sudden this radiates to the world. We got fractions in the world, don't we? We got divisions in the world. We're looking for every way that we can to dice everybody up so we can dissect them, compartmentalize them all over the place. The church isn't to look like that. Why? It's the body of Christ. Christ doesn't have his limbs scattered around all over the place like some grenade went off in his hand, does he? No, it's to be unified together. Or what Pastor Steve says, I love this, I'll never forget it. Fellowship is fellows in the same ship. I like it. Verse 22, the glory which you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be, what? Just as we are. There it is. I and them, you and me that they may be perfected, that they may be completed, is the word there, that they may be finished in unity. What's the reason? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Another way that the church demonstrates the righteousness is not just through the love that we have for one another, but the fact that we can stand as a unified people together, one faith under the authority of God's word because we have the Savior in our stead. Now, let's look at a different aspect of how we manifest the righteousness of God. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians, which is right after what, church? I love it. You guys are brilliant. Second Corinthians. <clears throat> I remember reading this as a new believer thinking, boy, this sure sounds funny. I wonder what this means. Chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, look at verse 14. But thanks be to God, who always, how often? He always leads us into triumph. In Christ, it's like a military general leading his soldiers because they've been victorious in battle. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, in Christ, 
and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Watch this. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God. Do you realize that when you are being obedient to the Lord, you are giving off the same sense as Christ does before the Father in his obedience. It's walking in fellowship. It's walking in the Spirit. It's walking by faith. That's what that is. So notice this. Not only does it give off to God, notice among those who are, number one, being saved, and among those who are, number two, who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death, and to the other, an aroma from life to life. Now, we could label this and said, are you stinky for Jesus? We could say that, right? That's not what we're talking about. But what does this mean? It means that as we go throughout our days, and we're not talking about Sunday mornings, we're talking about our Mondays through Saturdays, and you are living amongst the world, something is radiating off of you, and it is permeating culture. You ever had the person that's the sailor mouth? And then when they find out that you're a Christian, oh, I'm sorry, they do that, yeah? There's a cake lady in DeForest that's like that. I love her to pieces. She, like a sailor. I, I want to bring soap with me to clean her mouth out. But she bakes such a good cake, I don't know. Right? And I tell her, that's okay. If her having a foul mouth was the worst thing going on in the world, well, then we'd have a problem. The fact is, she needs Jesus. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not worried about trying to hold something like that against her. But isn't it interesting that just the presence of a Christian there immediately brings conviction? It's the aroma of death unto death. Because let's be honest, if it's not wrong to do that, then why hide it? Why apologize for that? If something like that is not wrong in some way, and notice that the conscience testifies. Oh, I shouldn't say that around them. Why? because it might be unacceptable because of what you believe or the conviction that you have. Isn't that interesting? And if it's not true, then why does it matter that much to you? The light bulb starts to go off. Why? Written on their heart. So notice, it's righteous. Now here's the other flip side of it. You ever been around a Christian and the more that you're around them, the more that you want to be around them because it just builds you up, it fills you up? Anybody? Nobody's like that here. Okay, good. Good. You find certain Christians and you say, yes, I want to hang out longer. Where did all the time go? Why is that? Because they are the aroma of life unto life, and it is an encouragement amongst the body of Christ. When we are just going throughout the world living life, there's something that is being given off to us, and it testifies to the unregenerate. There is condemnation for you, and it testifies to the regenerate. There is celebration for you. That is the difference. So when we talk about that God has revealed himself, not just in the outpouring of wrath against sin, but also through the church, whenever we are living for Christ, we are revealing his righteousness, his standards to the world at large. People take notice through our love, through our unity, through the simple fact of living our lives daily and what we give off. Now, time does not permit me, and I know that's never been a fact factor before time does not permit me to get into the reality and the difference that the indwelling holy spirit makes in the life of the believer in testifying to the existence of god and i will look to get in that sometime in the future but not right now but know that it's there what i find interesting about this is that all of this is intricately connected to the whole idea of creation and origins and this leads us to our third one if you Look back briefly at your Romans 1 section. I want to point out something very interesting to you about how Paul phrases this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is intentional by every means. And look at 19, chapter 119. Why is the wrath revealed? Well, here's the reason why. The suppression of truth is one thing from a man side. But from a God side, what does that look like? Look what he says in 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, and we see that because he's written the law in our hearts, our consciences testify against us. For God made it evident to them. 
In other words, he went to painstaking lengths in order to reveal and evaporate any question of whether or not he's there. Now watch what happens in verse 20. For, here's the explanation, since the creation of the world, when is that in time? Genesis what? Genesis 1 and 2. We have an unfolding there of everything that's going on in God's act of creation. Remember, there was nothing. God speaks. Matter exists. Matter has not been eternal. That is the view of the atheist or the scientist or the evolutionist. Matter is not eternal and it's not self-spontaneous, all that good stuff. It's not that. So notice, for since the creation of the world, his, now pay attention to this, guys, his invisible attributes. Now, if you remember, <coughs> excuse me, an attribute is a property which is intrinsic to its subject. It's something that is a characteristic in order to identify somebody as something. Now, here's the problem. Are we disputing whether or not the attribute is there? No, it tells us that, but the problem is it's what? It's invisible. Anybody seen anything invisible lately? You can all raise your hands. Do you realize that? According to this verse, verse 20 gives you a permission to say, I have successfully seen the unseen. Who God is in his person has been clearly seen. Look what the passage says. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, usually that's displayed as his godhood, his godness or his deity, his divinity. And his divine nature, I'm sorry, divine nature would be his divinity, have been clearly seen. Now, here's what's interesting about this Greek word. Clearly seen doesn't mean, mm, yeah, it's there. That's not what that means. It means that you actually have a deep mental perception of the reality of something existing. It's not just saying, yes, I think it's true, in other words. It is having the conviction that it has to be true because it couldn't be any other way, and your mind is convinced. If you were on a court of a jury trial and you knew the person was guilty, this would be the equivalent of you saying, I can clearly see that he did it. It's that type of attitude. It is, the evidence is irrefutable. This is what has happened. There's no other answer, okay? So when we talk about clearly seen, it's not just glasses on, focus made. That's not what it is. But it's not just that. Clearly seen being what? What's the word? Understood. Here's what this, and I I wrote out the definition because it was so good. To grasp. I can't even read my writing now. Good grief. I can't clearly see it. Oh, to grasp or comprehend something on the basis of careful thought. Notice it's to grasp or comprehend something on the basis of careful thought. It's calculating. You know, you pull up to the gas tank and you're like, okay, I've only got a quarter tank gas left. Gas is going for $2.59 a gallon, so it's going to cost me about 26 bucks to fill it. That's you calculating through. You see what I'm saying? That is you thinking through. That is you doing the math, putting all the pieces together in order to say this is going to be the end of the situation. Not only has God exposed himself invisibly, now clearly seen to our mental understanding and comprehension, but it is an embracing of that of which it is. Notice this. It's something based on careful thought. It's perceiving. Your mind has apprehended this idea. Now you say, why are you making such a big deal about this? Watch what happens. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. The creation. In other words, God created to make himself known. In fact, this is what we call theologically general revelation. It is something that God has displayed for everyone who might not have special revelation for the fact of saying, I'm here. I exist. I have put things into place. In fact, here's what's interesting about this. When I researched this, I found five arguments for God's existence just in this vein of creation. Let's go through each one of them and look at them. If you want to write them down quickly. Otherwise, raise your right hand and say, I solemnly swear I will listen to this podcast on the internet again. Let's go through those, Mitch. 
Arguments for God's existence. Number one, the religious argument. Everybody has the propensity to worship something. For the Old Testament times, pagan times, places outside of Israel, and even Israel was guilty of itself, we would say idols. If it's today, it's probably Taylor Swift. Tear down her poster, throw it in the fire. It'll do a lot more good that way, I promise. Mankind has the propensity to worship. That sheer instinct that we have, that we're drawn to worship something. John, can I put you on the spot? When you deal with all these different people groups, have you ever come across anyone from a different people group that was actually worshiping something else? Does that happen almost every time? Almost every time. And he is a learned man. They are learned people. I don't even know what that word means, but they are that. So everybody's got this propensity towards religion. Requirements that need to be met. I've got to pour out to something. How about a second argument for God's existence? The moral argument, or what's known as the anthropological argument. The fact that we have a moral nature. Now we saw that in Romans 2. But it's not just that. It suggests you have to come to the conclusion that a higher being has set certain standards. Has anybody noticed that no one puts together a society that's not structured? I love it whenever anarchists are having a meeting. That makes no sense, does it? Because they're always against and rebelling against all the norms and authorities and structures and all that. But I guarantee you when they get together for that meeting, they elect a president and somebody's in charge. We can't help it. Everything in us screams there must be order, there must be morals, and that we can take our fingers and say that is wrong and that is right. We can do that. Nobody had to teach us that. We just come to that understanding. God has so ingrained it in us. How about the next argument for this? The ontological argument. The human mind can conceive the idea of a perfect absolute being. How is it possible for you to think about that there is something greater that must be worshipped? if it wasn't a reality that it was already there. Just so you know, the ontological argument, it deals with the idea of the nature of existence or being is what it is. And so the sheer fact that we can conceive that there is such thing as a God is pretty good evidence that a God exists. Otherwise, we couldn't think about those things that aren't thinkable. Have you ever thought about something that's not thinkable? <laughs> Love that question. I see it took some of you, right? The gerbils on your wheels started perking up going, I better run on this one. I'm telling you. It's good. Some of you are like, he's a couple of sandwiches short of a picnic. That's okay. (laughs) How about number four? The fourth reason given. The teleological argument. All of existence contains structure, design, arrangement, and order. Therefore showing that there is purpose. Such evidence demands a creator. Somebody set this up. No one walks into a child's room. And see something put together with Legos and said, man, when you dump that out of the box, that's amazing that got stuck together. That never happens. It never works. You always see that there was something, some arrangement, some careful methodical application of intelligence that was put in the situation. Now, what's interesting about this argument is it's connected to something called the fine-tuning argument, which is interesting. There are indispensable physical constants that if changed in the slightest, life would be impossible to sustain. Let me give you an example for what we know about the earth spinning on an axis. Do you realize that if we were one degree closer to the sun, we would all fry? And if we were one degree further away, we would all freeze. Brings a whole new meaning to that song. He's got the whole world in his hands, doesn't it? Because all it takes is one degree. One degree. And this is the most basic example I could come up with. There's many other examples. Do you realize that there are six indispensable laws of science that have to be upheld in order for our bodies to just be functioning and they all uphold perfectly? Isn't that by chance? Isn't that so weird that that just worked out that way? Or is there a God testifying to his existence? How about the last argument here? The cosmological argument. There's cause and there's effect. And the fact that there is a cause and effect situation demands that there's a first cause. You walk into a room, you see somebody's desk, and those five little shiny balls are lined up, and they're going click, 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 click. You don't sit here and go, they just did that on their own. 
you know somebody came along and pulled it back and let it go at some point, don't you? Now, this initial uncaused first cause, we call his name Yahweh. That's who he is. The universe is not its own cause. Matter doesn't just spring spontaneously. It has a starting point. Five existence for God. Now, we can sit here and we can argue logic about God's existence all day long. Let's see what the scriptures have to say. Turn with me to Psalm 19. <clears throat> We're going to look at the first four verses here in Psalm 19. In the interest of time, I'm going to cut this slightly short because I want us to make sure we get to the point. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line, or probably better translated, their sound has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the earth. In them, he has placed a tent for the sun. What in the world does all that mean? It sounds real poetic and nice and makes me feel kind of warm. What all that means is, is that creation preaches. It means that the very design of all things that have been put together is trying to tell you and I a story of the existence of the almighty creator. Kevin, when you cut a tree down, you see those little rings in there. Does it tell you a story about that tree? Is it pretty intricate? You can tell dry seasons from simply looking at the rings of a tree. Now that's weird to me because I'm not a tree person. Is that what you're called a tree person? <laughs> Arborist. That's the medical name. But anyway, I'm just messing with you. Now here's the thing. Is that tree just telling its own story? Or is God telling you a story through the design of that tree? Do you realize that you can actually pinpoint what was going on in particular years if you just trace them backwards? Now, is that incredible or what? God has made himself known. In fact, when you and I live in righteousness and when you and I are interacting with the creation, and even when lost people are interacting with the creation, we are getting one big, bright, Las Vegas neon sign that says one thing, know me, know me. I am here, know me. And isn't that the invitation that every one of us have? We invite every single person to know him, to be reconciled unto God. Why? Because Jesus Christ has made it possible. You couldn't have done it without him. But now that Jesus has done what he's done, whoever will freely come. Now go back to Romans 1 for just one second. Because I don't want you to miss the major pinnacle of this argument that Paul is putting together. Romans 1. Verse 20, and I don't want you to miss it because of the significance that's bound up in this one word. Remember, what he is writing is intentional because it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's exactly what God wants you to know about this subject. <clears throat> he says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that here's the reason why God did this. Here's the reason why everything is so structured and set up and testifying to his existence. Here's the reason why. Look what it says. They are without what? No excuse. This word means defense. There's no defense. There's no argument. There's no, well, nobody ever told me. Well, nobody ever said anything. Well, nobody was curious about my problems. We live in such a victimized society. Who made us all so soft? Good grief. What has happened? Anybody scared of offending other people unusually? Where all these sensitive people come from. Good night, man. And notice this. God is unapologetic. And why is that? Because the message is clear. The message isn't just visually clear, it's mentally clear. And it's not just mentally clear, but it's clear in such a way as to where the invis invisible things about him can be grasped, comprehended, perceived, apprehended by the mind so that it calls for a change of attitude and direction of people and how they are facing a mighty God. Know me. 
Why should I know you? Because the evidence is clear and you are without excuse. What other choice do you have? Do you realize that the greatest tragedy of all human civilization is the fact that there is certain damnation for all people in the light of irrefutable and irrevocable evidence. And yet the holy God who has the ability to judge stands there with a wide open hand offering salvation to pull all who will grab a hold of his hand out of drowning water. And what do people do? They don't go, I can't find the hand. They smack it away. They suppress it in unrighteousness. They cast off restraint. Each one did what was right in their own eyes. Why? Because there wasn't a king amongst them. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I already have a king. He is Christ Almighty. He is now living and he has promised to return. He has promised to reward each one faithfully for the work that they have done in the body. Because in eternity it's going to matter when he sets up his divine government to rule over this world. And this is not a reason for us to become part of a death parade that champions the destruction of society, but in humility warns them that their actions are what is bringing the wrath to come. To call them out of the water and into the boat. Now just so there's no confusion about how that happens, John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word, whoever hears about Jesus Christ dying for sins, raised from the grave, and believes him who sent me, has eternal life. He will not come into judgment. King James says condemnation. He will not come into condemnation but has passed, has passed from death into life. There is nothing else for us to do. All the work has been done. The marching orders have already been given. The revelation of God is clear. To add anything to it would be to actually cover it up. Are you clear on what God wants us to do? Are you clear on the person that God wants us to talk to? Are you clear on the consequences for these people who don't know the Lord. How glorious is the gospel that it can save? Everybody with me? Who's asleep? Raise your hand. Let me make sure. Okay. Pray with me. Father God, how clear you are. Not just in your word. As believers, that's what we hold to for clarity about existence. But God, how your carefully designed and structured creation preaches to the world. It is a general revealing of yourself. And Father, how important it is for us as carriers, as light bearers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he alone saves, that there's salvation found in no one else. How important it is for us to be responding and following up that evidence with the message of his death and resurrection. You've made it clear. There are people that are ripe for salvation. Give us eyes to see. Father, if we are cold or indifferent to the things of God right now, melt our hearts, please. Give us holy unction to move forward in full faith, not being perfect creatures, but just simply being obedient. Father, forgive us where our goals are success and replace them with faithfulness. Help us to recognize that we don't live for the things of this world, but we have been called out of it. You have commissioned us to be heralds that meekly and humbly, but truthfully and lovingly, call others to be reconciled to you. God, let us give all praise and honor and glory to you and ascribe all majesty to you because you have provided a savior that does not sink deep in our hearts right now lord break up our hearts make it follow ground for your message for your truth your word is truth help us father we pray it please in jesus name
Amen.